Aloha. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator and Big Island ER physician. Today I'm lucky to have a colleague and friend come on my program. We're going to talk about the concussion epidemic, and I'm going to introduce you right now to Dr. Bob Sloan. Bob, hey, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Bob's an MD as well. He was trained at UC Davis uh, for his residency and medical school. He's been the director of the concussion care centers. He uh, did Department of Defense work, hospice director in Kona, Ironman work, Winter Olympics, past president of Honolulu County Medical Association, HMA leadership, that's Medical Association. You've been a leader in this area, am I mistaken? Well, it's been my main interest and uh, I really appreciate you allowing me to talk about my favorite subject. So I, I've been doing this for 25 years, I think. It's fantastic. So uh, today we're talking about, as you put it very eloquently, the concussion epidemic. What does it mean when we hear concussion epidemic? I know a lot of people probably have different thoughts. Well, it's really a silent epidemic until recently. You know, we've really been improving education and understanding of it. Um, there's a lot more concussions going on than we thought, but what we're more worried about lately are what are called subconcussive blows, which are the ones that don't quite cause the problems the, like loss of consciousness and headaches and symptoms but seem to be possibly as important or more important than concussions so uh, if you take those into account it's a true epidemic because we've been underappreciating how many are going on how bad they are and what we should do to take care of these problems especially in our kids well it's so important um, for people to hear this why don't we start them from <coughs> scratch Explain to people, you and I have, haven't gone through med school understand, but what is, in your mind, the definition of a concussion, a true concussion? Well, I like to call it when your brain is shaken and stirred. Okay. What happens is any impact force that moves the skull, so it could actually be an impact to your chest, could be a car accident that simply causes you to move like this, but anything that causes the skull to suddenly move causes an acceleration, deceleration, injury to the brain. And the brain is sitting inside rather loose in our skulls, as opposed to animals that bang their heads for a living, like woodpeckers and rams, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they actually have really tight connections. We don't. Our brains are not made to be hitting things. Our skulls are not made to be hitting things. When we do get our bodies or our heads impacted by a force, a collision of some kind, the brain not only moves around and can bang the bony prominences inside the skull, which would cause more severe brain injuries like uh, contusions and bleeds, but also the brain gets kind of twisted and shaken and stirred and stretched. There's shear forces that occur to the nerve cells mm -hmm. that cause them to stop working at least temporarily. So a concussion is a temporary derangement of brain function. It doesn't have to be loss of consciousness, but just a problem with how the brain works because of an impact force. So uh, an individual has an accident, an injury, how serious does it have to be to cause a concussion? Boy, that's a good question. We're starting to look at G-forces and that kind of thing. And um, I don't know if we really know for everyone how much of an impact, but anytime you hit your head and it hurts and you get dizzy, uh, you feel, you know, you see stars, you feel a little bit, uh, uncomfortable, not yourself, you get confused, have memory problems. Uh, those are all serious concussions. And just to give you an example, in football, uh, we believe that in a season, the, the kids and the adults that are playing contact football are getting 10 to 1,500 impacts a day at 20 G-forces and up, which is plenty enough to cause concussions and these subconcussive blows. Amazing. Now, when I was in school back in the 80s, and football was the sport, uh, soccer and lacrosse and other sports were just beginning to emerge, I know a lot of people spend most of their time talking about football, uh, but you seem to be suggesting that it doesn't even have to be football, lots of ways to be concussed. Yeah, you brought up lacrosse. Actually, originally we knew about it in boxing, and that's been known for many, many years. Um, the term pugilistic Parkinsonism or punch drunk syndrome that came out of boxing mm -hmm. had to be changed and it actually was changed to traumatic encephalopathy some time ago because we started to realize other sports including 
horseback riding, equestrian sports in the Olympics and such. Those were boxing and, and those sports were known initially. Now we're finding out it's in everything from uh, um, football, cheerleading even, um, judo, wrestling, volleyball, basketball. Anytime you're getting hit or landing hard, mm -hmm. you can get these kind of concussions. Of course, in our young kids, bicycle riding. So it doesn't have to be a sport, but just a recreational activity, mm -hmm. bicycle riding, um, and that kind of thing can cause uh, increased skateboarding. Anything that has a fall or an impact is yes. basically what you're saying. But it doesn't have to be necessarily an impact from a hit. Can, that means you can fall, hit the ground, of course. But what about just getting jolted? Can that cause a, uh, a traumatic injury? Yeah, we've learned so much about that lately that even the NFL has changed their practice, uh, the way they practice. They're actually hitting less often and less hard in practices now just to prevent these concussive injuries. I think, I, I hesitate because subconcussive, what does that really mean? It's still a concussion. We just don't see the symptoms as badly, but it turns out that the brain damage that occurs with these cumulative repetitive injuries are actually very serious. Wow, okay, so okay, first we have concussions. Uh, when someone gets a concussion, as you described, the brain has been shaken and stirred like you describe. How much uh, worry does one have to have if their child or they themselves have that initial concussion? Well, previously we didn't worry too much about it. In fact, we worried much too little about it. In fact, I was probably the most conservative return to play doc in the islands mm -hmm. uh, for 20, 25 years, and I wasn't being careful enough. Nowadays, we know pull them out, don't let them play, prevent any other injuries. There's something called sports synergy where, you know, if you pull a kid out of football, and I just had a case actually this year, kid was pulled out of football too late. He had actually had two concussions in the game before he finally was pulled out. Mm -hmm. He was not allowed to return to play, but within two or three days, he went out surfing at Sandy Beach hit his head on the sand again, and now his symptoms were much worse, lasted much, much longer. And we think it's these cumulative, repetitive injuries that are really important for the chronic problems that can show up later in life, but also um, it can lead to something called second impact syndrome, which probably is a misnomer, but what it is is if a kid is allowed to play, usually it's only in children, so I say uh, um, a child, um, doesn't usually happen in adults, but if you let a child play while they're still symptomatic, while their brain is still not functioning well, we believe the brain is having a, a energy crisis. It needs a lot of energy and time to heal, mm -hmm. and you're putting them back out there, exerting energy, losing energy while they're playing, and then they get hit again. This can cause what's called a fulminant um, you know, swelling of the brain that can actually cause death. And these are the things you hear about. We, we lose probably three high school kids a year in the United States to this sudden death from football that's mostly due to these brain injuries. Wow. So if a child has uh, hurt themselves and they get pulled out of the sport, how long does it normally take before you approve uh, a kid to go back in? What's the, what's, you know, What's the gestalt on that? Well, this is so important because almost all the studies were done on adults, college kids and, and pros. Okay. And we believe in that age group because the brains are more mature and, and stronger in a sense, mm -hmm. um, that it usually takes just seven to 10 days. So it's very convenient for the NFL that we keep them out for a week and they can actually play yes. the next week if they clear the, the new protocols. Children are much more sensitive and need much more time. Um, we're thinking now two to three weeks minimum, probably a month. Got it. So, and that's if someone has had major concussion symptoms, they're gonna be assessed and reassessed. They'll see a doctor like you. They will see who else? What other providers are the, are the right people for a, a patient to see? Good question. The law requires now, especially at the high school level, and just at the high school level, I guess, that um, a child that's removed from play um, has to be released by a physician. And the question is, do you need an expert in brain injury mm -hmm. and concussion to do that? Or can just a, an ER doctor or a family practitioner do it? I think any doctor can do it as long as they're well trained in how to assess 
the severity, the degree, what's important, what's to look for. Um, usually the kids can't go back until they're asymptomatic, which means they don't have any symptoms. But unfortunately, every age group that knows how to get away with it might not be forthright about what they're feeling. They might be trying to get out to play. Uh, they might even be told by someone, don't say that you know, you're dizzy or that you have a headache. And sometimes they don't take it very seriously. In years past, we were told to shake it off yeah. and get out there and play. And, and that actually caused a lot of problems. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I'm sorry. I got so much that I want to say. No, you really did. So, okay, so again, child has a concussion. They've got significant symptoms. Uh, they're dizzy. They're weak. They're seeing stars. They have headache. They're weak uh, in an extremity. Um, they now are out for a period of time. Uh, you want them to see a trained professional. Could be ideally someone who's had real significant exposure to the training and into the field like yourself. So uh, someone like you or a neurologist. But if you have an internal medicine doc that's decided to take an interest, you can become comfortable with their, I guess, their skill set. What other people? What about like trainers? Do the um, high school trainers have the capacity to do a good assessment in your mind? Should they make sure that they're working with a doc? How does that work? Well, just to get back to it, so even a pediatrician, a family practice doc, yeah. some of them have great training fellowships in brain in sports. Yes. And so they're usually well trained. Um, athletic trainers are, are close to me um, because I've been working with them for many years. In California, we passed a bill which we required athletic trainers at every football game. Um, along with an ambulance and a physician. They couldn't even start the game without all three of those. That actually helped a lot, but it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, recently in Hawaii, we've had a whole lot more schools with, with athletic trainers, and athletic trainers are very well versed in this. In fact, they've been leading the, uh, the charge here in Hawaii and, and helping get things going. Um, at the high school level especially where they have been able to do these studies with pre and post psych testing, neuropsych testing where they they study the kids before the brain injury, before they get a concussion to get a baseline and then if they get a concussion they use the follow-up studies to determine whether they are really not symptomatic because even if they say I feel fine but you can find there's ongoing brain problems uh, the newest stuff, actually I've been talking about this for 10 or 15 years, but just in the last year, two good studies came out that showed that orthopedic injuries, knee injuries and other kind of injuries, um, muscle, nerve, bone injuries are actually increased after a concussion. And uh, of course, if you're having those orthopedic problems, you are more likely to fall and hit your head also. So it's really a vicious cycle. So you really want, as the doc, to see uh, kids when they have an injury like this. You want to see them out of the sport until they get really good clearance from an expert, pediatrician or neurospecialist. You have the team in place, and then you're doing more than just prevent repetitive head injuries and, God forbid, tra traumatic encephalopathy, but you're also preventing any number of other injuries. Yeah. How are we doing in the state? How, how's Hawaii match up with other major states, other places that got big sports programs? Well, we've really improved. I think almost every state, if not every state, now has a law that started in, in Washington. Actually, I guess in California we started that one, mm -hmm. um, but it became much more sophisticated out of Washington recently. Um, when a boy almost died from this second impact syndrome. He's still severely disabled, but he's actually one of the proponents for education and warning people and, and ma how, to, how to manage these cases. So, you know, there's, there's a couple of things. One is a single concussion can cause death. Yes. Well, let me change that. A single brain injury can cause death. So I may not have clarified this, but concussions are brain injuries. Um, a more severe brain injury with bleeding and that kind of thing, fracture of the skull, um, you know, actually is much more serious and can cause death. Um, second impact syndrome can cause death, and this seems to be due to just concussions. Can be more than that. We don't know a lot about it. But um, a single concussion and then playing again and getting another one can cause death. And, and the second concussion doesn't even have to be a serious one. It would have been one that anybody would have survived, but because you're not healed up from the first one, it can actually kill you. So it is very, 
very serious problem. And then in addition to that, so if we pull everybody out, rest them, and then allow them to go back, we're allowing them to go back and have another concussion if that happens, but we're protecting them from these more serious uh, problems. Except now we know that this thing you mentioned, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what got me up and speaking again in the last two or three years to virtually every hospital, CME for doctors in, the, in this island at least, um, that is a problem from repetitive trauma that isn't even sensed or noticed by anyone. I think that's a, I think this is a good segue. We we'll take a break and we come back. I want to move into that discussion and I want to talk about what's happening in kind of um, the pop media and social milieu where they're talking about concussions now again with this new movie that just came right. out. So I'm Josh Green, Healthcare in Hawaii, your host. I'm joined today by Dr. Bob Sloan. Thanks for joining us. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McDeck, asking you to come join us on Think Tech Hawaii Hibachi Talk. Join me and my two hosts, Gordo the Texar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 12.45 till 13.45. See you on Fridays, and remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. <laughs> Aloha, you can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host Matthew Johnson here with Justine Espiritu. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as... Uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, a physician. Uh, I work at the Senate as well. Today we're having a discussion about the concussion epidemic, and I'm joined by Hawaii's expert, Dr. Bob Sloan, trained at Davis. Uh, he's a physician and really been kind of a proponent to take care of people that have had head injuries, to look out for our keiki, to make sure that we are on the cutting edge with many other states. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, when we left off the last conversation, uh, fifth, our first 15 minute segment, you had spoken very passionately about what a concussion means. We talked about, uh, when there's a repeat concussion and what that impact can be and how even just a smaller impact can cause problems, even in some cases death, very serious problems. You spoke a little bit about uh, return to play. I thought maybe I'd ask you to unpack that a little bit for, um, for our audience. I know a lot of people who will watch this show, they'll be saying, okay, my child plays football or has another contact sport that he or she are in. Um, what do I have to expect if there is a concussion? So break it down for us, Doc. Well, just so that we don't forget this, there are pro NFL players who are quitting football right now because they're finding out how serious this is and they want to prevent these chronic uh, problems. But um, if we can limit the impact forces and limit the number of them, the kids will all do a lot better. Um, if you pull the kid out and he uh, has time to rest, um, and he becomes asymptomatic, so no headache, no dizziness, no disorientation. Sometimes the athletes just feel like there's something not right. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what it is. That can be one of the very important signs of concussion. But once they really are feeling better, probably a few weeks later, um, and in minor injuries, maybe it is less time. We just want to, you know, be cautious about it. Right. Um, we can start to test them because they may not be symptomatic at rest. They may feel fine, but they might go to school and have problems, feel a little bit disoriented, get headaches. They might try to go out and play and uh, get a headache. So we have to actually test them, and that's one of the things that the doctors have to do when the when the child or the athlete comes in is pro try to provoke symptoms. So it's as simple as having them run. Most clinics you can't have them run, you know, 40 yards, but um, we can have them do push-ups, 
jumping jacks. If you can, you should try to get them to sprint. Yes. Um, you may even want to check karaoke, some more complex movements, depending on, you know, if you really want to be hands-on in this, but that's what the athletic trainers do now. So if the athlete comes and sees me and I think they're ready, mm -hmm. I send them back to school at the high school level and the athletic trainer will put them through a six-day protocol. Initially aerobic conditioning, bicycle, stationary bike, maybe some light weights after that. Every day they can progress so they can get back in a week, which might not be, might not be long enough. But um, actually one of the problems is I might not see the athlete soon enough. And so I might see them and go, wow, you're ready to go and, and play the championship game tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, that's not allowed. The athletic trainer will say, no, you got to go through this six days. So the sooner they get in and see somebody that can clarify whether they're ready can be really helpful. But as long as they're asymptomatic, mm -hmm. they c you don't provoke symptoms. You can get them even doing drills, heavier weight training, ultimately uh, limited, uh, controlled contact. The problem with most of the return to play protocols right now is it goes from limited contact to full contact. And I think there might need to be a little extra step in there, but how do you measure that? Sure. So once they're at practice, full contact, no symptoms, they're not getting new concussions, they're usually ready to go out and play. And that means what? no headache, no dizziness, no confusion, no goodness, for goodness sake, no weakness in the extremities. Anything else that we should be watching for? Well, that's a good question. I, I've had a, a concussion or two in my sports career. One of them was real subtle. I hit my head on the diving board. I actually was in Seoul for the Olympics when Greg Louganis hit his head on the diving board, and we were worried about his concussion and whether he was going to be able to come back. We actually didn't know about the HIV status at the time, but um, what I noticed when I hit mine, I, of course, was never near what Greg Luganis could do, but I had a hard time balancing on the board after that. Interesting. Nobody knew I had a concussion. I didn't even know what was wrong, but I had a little bit difficulty feeling where I was in the air. So, like I said, just not feeling yourself, not being up, you know, to your game, um, starting to get orthopedic injuries that you maybe wouldn't have gotten. We usually just say, oh, that's part of the game, but now we're starting to put all this stuff together. Right, and so you've now got really a protocol, as do states and the professional football league and so on. Everyone's got the protocol. What about imaging? Uh, remind me, do MRIs or CT scans help in this process of both diagnosing and also clearing uh, patients? Well, really good question. Normally, radiology is not required. Um, you don't see anything on MRI, not, not with the ones we use every day. Uh, usually in a serious brain injury, you're going to get a CAT scan because it's quicker and, and uh, you, you can see bleeds and skull fractures, and that's important. And obviously, if they have a seizure on the field, if they have weakness like you mentioned, especially unilateral weakness, I always look for hyperreflexia, uh -huh. um, nystagmus, things that might suggest that there's more going on, any kind of... Uh, problem that makes the doctor think there's something more serious, what's called a unilateral injury on the brain. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to get a, a CAT scan or, or an MRI or both um, to fully evaluate that. But in everyday concussion care, it's usually not needed unless there's a complication. If there, I guess most of us would say, boy, if they're out on the field for, used to be five minutes, now it's two minutes. I think probably if they lose consciousness at all, you gotta keep a much closer eye on them, watch really closely, because they could have a sudden bleed, and you, you know as well as I do about epidurals, there's this lucid interval. So the kid is fine, he, he got concussed, he comes off the field, he goes, man, that was bad, I don't even remember the, the play. And you say, okay, you got to sit it out. You probably nowadays know he's not going to play for a week. But if you put him on the bench and don't pay attention or send him to the locker room for a shower, they can have a sudden collapse from a sudden epidural bleed from that initial insult. They actually lose consciousness, wake up, and actually feel pretty good. They feel okay but they're having this rapid arterial high pressure bleed on the brain that would lead to symptoms. You gotta watch them close, keep an eye on them, check on them frequently. Um, and those are more serious and those definitely need evaluation with CAT scanner 
or MRI. And those are going to require very likely an intervention, a surgeon to, to help us. Good question. My first sports brain bleed, I was a doctor for the California Police Olympics in California, and it, it's actually the largest athletic event in the United States, second only to the Olympics. And uh, I was a doc for all the events, but I, I liked boxing. I, think, I thought I needed to be there. And I watched a guy win, um, went about on Monday, again on Wednesday, and again on Friday. Now, I wouldn't recommend we do that anymore. In fact, here in Hawaii, the athletes are allowed to play two days in a row. Mm -hmm. And I'm against that because that increases their risk. Um, but anyway, he did really well Monday, Wednesday. It was dominant, and then he had to go against the other guy that was dominant. And he took quite a few shots. He ended up winning, but as he was walking out of the ring, he was limping. Oh, boy. So I went up just to congratulate him and say, how you doing? What's going on? Did you sprain your ankle? And he goes, I, I don't know, Doc. My leg feels funny. And right then his pupil blew while I'm talking to him. Wow. So I rushed him. We had ambulance at the scene. I had oxygen. I rushed him to the hospital head up. And he actually did really well. I thought he was going to have to be evacuated because I suspected an intracranial bleed, a hematoma. But actually, he stabilized. They didn't have to do anything. They kept a close eye on him. He actually was able to return to being a police officer, but never boxed again, of course. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, these stories are just incredible. Uh, if I may, can we turn our attention to um, what's been going on kind of in the public lately? Uh, the movie came out, a movie called Concussion, I believe, right? Starring Will Smith. How has that affected uh, the, the discipline that you've become so expert in? Tell us a little bit about that movie and what your impression has been and what, have they been on the mark with it? Yeah, I think the movie was great. I hope a lot of people see it. I think every athlete should see it. Uh, every parent of athletes should see it. Every physician should see it if they haven't uh, been on top of this and haven't watched uh, the uh, Frontline show called League of Denial about the NFL, uh, because this is very well characterized in that two-hour show. Uh, the one that's on the screen now with Will Smith is wonderful. Um, I kind of already knew that whole story, but it's just very exciting to see this being talked about because it, it's going to revolutionize at least how people uh, listen nowadays. Because there were times when I had coaches that didn't want to listen to me. I had parents who don't want to listen to me. Um, but what happened is this uh, doctor from uh, Nigeria, very well trained, uh, extremely smart guy, came to America. He loves America. He didn't know much about football, but he was um, just a, a neuropathologist or a pathologist in Pittsburgh. And I understand I'm that's from, where you're from. I'm from so yeah. you know about this too. And he got Mike Webster, an NFL player who was uh, very well known, who had actually deteriorated later in life. He had to do an autopsy on him. And uh, he didn't even know who he was, so he didn't have any secondary gain issues. Uh, I really believe in his heart he just was hoping that if he found anything that it could help society. Um, and what he found was shocking. Um, it's kind of surprising none of this was noted in the past, but you can't diagnose this chronic traumatic encephalopathy until post-mortem brain biopsy, and we just don't do that on live people. So, Bob, so pictures... Um Let's say Mike Webster. So Mike Webster, for people who don't know, I mean, I growing up as a Pittsburgher, we all know Mike Webster, number 52 on the Steelers. He was the center. Not a big guy, brilliant center, Hall of Famer, led us to four Super Bowl championships. Great, incredible centerpiece of that team. But every single play, he was hitting his head in a huge collision with the nose tackle on the other side. Had this NFL career, 12, 14 years, superstar. Then what we knew about him in Pittsburgh was in those years after, he started suffering. He became homeless. He um, seemed to have memory problems. He had problems with rage, was my understanding. The team ultimately did their best to try to take care of him and help out, but no one knew. Now, had he gotten an MRI scan or CT scan, would we have seen anything at that point? Well, it's interesting. Omalu thought the brain looked normal, but that's looking at the outside. He was actually surprised because Mike Webster looked uh, very bad for a man his age yes. when he was discovered. Um, 
MRI will show things like a cavum septum pollucidum, which is damage in an area of the brain, um, atrophy, which is cell loss, which is not good for the brain, um, and ventricular enlargement. It can show a lot of things that we've known for years in uh, uh, dementia pugilistica, the boxing injuries, right. but nobody had ever shown it in football. Oh. And so, Mike should have been evaluated, and uh, maybe somebody missed it. Um, and and these things you could have guessed, but again, and it, we didn't understand this disease uh, until Bennett Omalu, the movie is about him, actually decided I'm going to look at this brain. And apparently, there was some resistance to it. He he wanted to look at it. People said no, no need, don't do it. Um, but he persisted, and then he found it in other football players. And now we've got brain banks that are looking at it. They've had over 100 athletes they're looking at. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little skewed because they're only getting the brains probably from people who thought there was something wrong that might show up. Right. But the incidence is 80 90% have it. And this is a tauopathy, the protein deposits of tau that are also found in Alzheimer's. But in this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, they're found in unique distributions. And these distributions have never been found in any other disease, so it's unique. Um, and that was prob part of the problem is that a lot of these uh, athletes started looking maybe just like they had Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia that are w more well known, um, when actually they had this unique traumatic brain damage called it encephalopathy from chronic injuries. And it's interesting because linemen seem to have more of an incidence, cornerbacks. Um, actually, more recently, they found it in ends and, you know, and, and they've, the NFL, other than just not hitting as often during practice, they've also, if you notice, they're kicking off now at the 35, so they're not running as far. And that seems to have decreased the concussion incidence. There's even some thinking because of what Bennett Omalu and Mike Webster showed us, yes. um, that uh, maybe they're going to stop the kickoff someday. Uh, the, my understanding is they're thinking about after a touchdown, you get the ball at your own 30 and you either run or punt. And so that's going to be, a, 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 that would be kind of interesting and exciting, but there's a lot of resistance to changing the game. There is. This is a perfect time for us to take our second break. and we come back, we're going to talk more about football, other sports, helmets, and your vision for the future. This is Josh Green, Healthcare in Hawaii, ER doc, joined by Dr. Bob Sloan, talking to us about the concussion epidemic. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and I want to thank you for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. We are delighted to be partners with ThinkTech because it gives us the opportunity to bring to you a show every week on Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. called Ehana Kako. Ehana Kako means let's work together because we believe that Hawaii will be a better place when everybody works together. And in what way? Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we research three basic areas and we invite guests to come on board from across the country, the state, and the nation to talk about a better economy, a better government, a better society. Now, aren't those things we all want? Indeed. If you'd like to have the latest research in terms of public policy, as well as ways in which we can build a better government economy and society, then tune in every Monday on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock p.m. for our fascinating guests on Ehana Kako. Let's work together. I'm Kaylee Iakina with the Grassroot Institute, and I'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, today joined by Dr. Bob Sloan, who is our expert in Hawaii on traumatic head injuries and the concussion epidemic. Bob was just telling us about this movie that's come out where uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers had a unique individual, Mike Webster, who was ultimately not just a Hall of Famer, but suffered a severe brain injury over the course of his shortened life. It was discovered by a prominent Nigerian physician that he had a condition now described as traumatic encephalo encephalopathy, uh, which really damaged him and made him degenerate quickly in life. Now you're taking uh, the perspective of what does it mean to us as a society because we have young people, now that we have this awareness about traumatic encephalopathy, you're worried about young people, football players. You're telling me earlier in our um, discussion before we started 
judo, girls judo. So there's all these sports. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? What should parents be thinking about? Well, it's real interesting uh, because my daughter played judo and um, the last two years, girls judo in Hawaii actually had a higher incidence than football and we're not sure why, but girls in general have a higher incidence in basketball and volleyball and uh, those kind of sports. So in soccer, um, we're not sure why. We thought it might be neck strength, but the latest study on strengthening the neck didn't improve concussion. So uh, we still don't have a good treatment for this. Um, my, uh, my, my concern is almost every sport with speed and, and possible impacts, because on the basketball court, you're not supposed to get a concussion, but you get elbowed, you fall down and hit your head. Sure. You know, in volleyball, you get spiked in the face. These things are gonna happen, and we just need to protect the kids both from the acute concussion, the second impact syndrome, and the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Also, uh, I didn't mention this, but Mike Webster and everyone else with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the question is why did they seem to get it later in life? Why didn't Mike have it right at the time he retired? Right. Well, he probably did have a little bit of it, um, but we actually now found that uh, this tau protein, these tangled deposits that choke off the brain and, and, and cause the nerve damage that prevents the brain from functioning, actually spread later in life even after you stop getting concussions and that's the scariest thing the guy who discovered um, mad cow disease yes he uh, dr prusiner out of san francisco he's now being invited to all the concussion talks around the, the world because the tangled tau protein in alzheimer's and in uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy the way the protein, the, it's a natural protein in our bodies, just like the prion of mad cow disease, but something causes it to misfold and get all tangled and stop working and clog things up. And he is the one that discovered this unique infectious thing. Um, I don't think it's an infectious problem in concussions, except that when you have a short temper, one of the symptoms, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, memory problems, behavioral problems, and psychological problems, uh, cognitive difficulties, um, the behavioral problems like short fuse, losing your temper, blowing up, we see now um, in many, much of our population, in fact, in the NFL, it's been in the news a lot the last year or two, and I'm wondering, are some of these problems with uh, spousal abuse and other things, is it due to these chronic traumatic encephalopathy? And this is important in our prison population also. But anyway, the, the, the tangling of the tau protein occurs during damage, and then it seems to get worse and spread later. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Anne McKee, who's uh, uh, probably the most famous neuropathologist now because she's studying all these brains in Boston with this um, uh, brain group that she's with. Um, she said that there is a transport mechanism where the, these tau proteins can be spread and transported into healthier parts of the brain, causing deterioration later in life. So that's even another level of you know, scary stuff going on with these concussions. Right, but as we study these things, I guess I was a little bit optimistic as I heard you say those things, because now that we understand the, you know, the pathophysiology a little bit better, and we have the institutes, which are obviously now seeing a lot more funding and seeing a lot more activity and seeing this huge amount of public awareness because of experts like you in the movie, it's su su suggestive that we'll be able to begin looking at different ways to treat um, these tra uh, traumatic brain injuries, not just through prevention, which is going to be obviously our, our main focus, and uh, education so that people see shows like this one and they understand it's not just six days necessarily if you've got a 15 or 16 year old, maybe it's longer. Yeah. But also, if there is a pathophysiologic pathway, maybe we'll be able to arrest that pathway or deal with that pathway in some you know, in some populations that are high risk. Is that a possibility? Yeah, they're really looking for something to stop that protein from tangling up and clogging things, uh, even if you do get a concussion. Um, and of course, this is applicable to Alzheimer's also. We're, right. we're looking for the thing that stops the amyloid uh, 
de deposits in Alzheimer's. So a lot of the same people are studying these things, trying to put it all together. That was my next question. Are they starting to collaborate now that, in, in a way, it's almost like this discipline has exploded in the last five years. Yeah. At, I mean, I've known that you've been an expert for many years. We've talked on occasion at our meetings and things, but to now see it everywhere, I mean, I got my... You know, my brother-in-law, who's got a 12-year-old in football, he asks about it, and we're preparing to... My 5-year-old has his first soccer game uh, this coming Saturday, and he's excited. But I remember seeing stars periodically, and I was an aggressive soccer player. And, you know, I had friends that had major concussions on the soccer pitch, and now, in fact, his dad, my best friend, who is um, our star soccer player, his dad was a pediatrician. And in those days, we sent him back out. Yeah. And so everybody's learning quite a lot. We have just a few minutes left, um, Dr. Sloan. What would be the take-home message for a mom or a dad or an uncle or auntie right now? If they've got kids that are interested in sports, what would you tell them? What would you tell them candidly as a father and as the expert? Well, concussions are more serious than we thought. Um, I like to say you can't ice the brain. Most orthopedic injuries, you can ice it, it gets better, you give it time to heal. The brain is more delicate, you can't ice it. Um, and it takes longer time to heal. And it's the fundamental thing that runs everything, um, including getting the kids through school, through college, and that kind of thing. So um, be careful, uh, limit the amount of sports that might cause injury. Um, you know, it's, it's actually a small subset, and maybe not small, maybe 10, 15, 20% of people that will get this real bad chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So there seems to be a genetic component we haven't figured out yet. We know some of the genes that might be involved, um, but right now we don't know who's gonna get it, so you really need to limit these concussions. You need to keep the kids out, have them see an expert who can say, yeah, it's safe to go back. Is it really safe to go back and bang your heads? I think we need to not, uh, a lot of people, not just me, believe we shouldn't be having contact um, sports uh, of that nature until the kids are 12 or 14 and even that's arbitrary. When is it actually safe to bang your head and damage your brain? Sorry. Every concussion is a brain damage and but you know so not everybody will get the severe form and not every concussion is a huge concern. Most of them do heal up and they can go back to their sport but you got to give it enough time to heal. And then uh, you expect a lot of research literature and findings in the coming years? Yeah, there's a whole lot going on right now. Unfortunately, we, we haven't found anything that decreases the amount of time it takes to heal. Yes. Uh, living a good life, eating well, all those things that are important for everything else are important. Even for chronic traumatic encephalopathy, people do tend to do better with concussions and other kinds of brain damage if they eat well, get plenty of sleep. That's very important. We used to wake kids up all night long to be sure they're okay. It's probably not a good idea. Who thought of that? You know, the body wants to rest, it needs to sleep. We were worried they were gonna have a sudden event and we were gonna lose them, so we were told, and some, I don't know about you, but I probably told parents, yeah, check on them, wake them up, be sure they're okay. Bad idea, let them sleep it off, let them rest, but um, over rest is a big concern. That's the last thing maybe I should say, is that we might have been resting them too long. A day or two of Pretty much total rest, maybe no school, even TV and video games, not a good idea. Um, but you got to get them up fairly quickly and let them start doing stuff. Otherwise, they'll get depressed. You tell them you can't do your sport anymore, they'll get depressed and they'll do worse because of the depression than because of a simple concussion. Excellent, excellent information. And then one last question. Kid has a concussion, another season, another major concussion. What's the threshold to tell them to to go to other sports? Quigley's rule says three in a season. Um, they probably shouldn't play that sport anymore. You know, you gotta worry, why are they getting these concussions? Are they more susceptible? Every concussion you get makes you more susceptible to another one. So, um, you know, if you let it go on, you, you, can, uh, you can get a lot of problems. Um, and I think just 
you know, one or two concussions, maybe you should say, hey, let's have a longer rest at least. That There's been times when I've, you know, the, the athlete has been really sad that I'm keeping them out for the season because maybe it happened later in the season, so the season's over. Our seasons are so short here. Yes. Um, but, oh, sorry about that. This is one of your patients, colleagues, yeah. so we're feeling lucky today. told myself not to do that. Um, but I told him, look, you know, you're going to be ready next year to go back and be better than ever. And, you know, he felt better about that, but it's really hard to tell a kid not to play. Okay. Well, this has been an excellent conversation. As you can see, audience, we have our uh, brain specialist here, Dr. Bob Sloan. He's on demand. He's on call for, for the community. He's bringing information back to us from around the world on traumatic head injuries. We're talking about the concussion epidemic, traumatic encephalo encephalopathy, and all of what that will mean to our children who play contact sports. We don't want to be alarmist, but we want you to be safe. So I feel like we've had this, had this conversation. If you need more information, you call me. You call Dr. Bob Sloan. He's available to us. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. So